everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Couchcast Charity Podcast, where today we're very lucky to be joined by another very special guest. It's Mr. Christopher Chung. Hi, Chris. Hey, hey. how are you? I'm all good. How are you keeping yourself? Yeah, not bad. It's a rainy day today, so it kind of dampened my plans to go out for a run, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite used to being stuck indoors for the last three months, so. <laughs> oh, we're all used to it by now. So we've got a few questions here for you today, Chris. No worries. So we're just going to fire away. And the first question is, what, what was the first thing that made you think, I want to be an actor? What was the start of it all? Oh, wow. Um, so I, I grew up in Australia. Uh-huh. And I have, uh, I have two older sisters and a brother. And my oldest sister, she used to do amateur musical theatre. So yeah. um, I just remember as a kid, I was probably about four or five always going to see her productions and always thinking wow I mean that looks like so much fun that looks like something that I'd love to do yeah and, um, I just kind of followed on through with that all throughout primary school like I was always you know performing for anyone that would watch me as a kid in my living room making all yeah. my uncles come and watch <laughs> whatever shows I would create in my head and you know make them come and see and then uh, as I went through high school, I, I started to get a little bit more serious about it. And that's when I started training and singing. And then I started training as an actor. Yeah. So that's really cool. So would your sister have been one of your role models who went up sort of when you were younger? Yeah, definitely. I always reference her as like the person that always gave me the first spark to kind of, to kind of go through with it. I think she would have liked to have kind of gone for this, for, for a career in it as well. But I, I, I think when she was growing up, it was she was trying to get more of a, a steady career, which we all know. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, there we go. So, had you always wanted to be an actor? Yeah, I think so. I mean, like, there's definitely. Um, I think when I talked to my parents about, you know, on various occasions, what I wanted to do with my life, um, it was always the thing that kind of pulled me the most. My dad always would say to me, you know whatever you do, you just have to be the best at it and you have to yeah. really go. And that's something that I've always kind of worked towards. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've, I have a backup plan as well mentality. So yeah. making sure that I have something else going on. So, um, like I said, I think it's not the most stable profession. Um, and it's always good to have something else as well so that you're not completely invested in a absorbed by it all the time yeah because it can become very obsessive and insular uh, which i don't think is great for your mental health so i work as a personal trainer as well which is kind of a a great side hustle too because it contributes yeah. to that to keeping yourself nice and fit and healthy um but yeah i think my main passion is performing well we're gonna kind of segue on now to more questions about actually performing and we're gonna sure. start off about waterloo road oh so, good uh, were you a fan of the show before it was season nine you joined, wasn't it? Yeah, I joined in season nine. Um, I hadn't actually heard of the show because when I auditioned for the show, I had just moved to the UK from Australia. So I had been in London for um, maybe three, six months, six months. Yeah. I've been in the UK. So I hadn't really any... Uh, awareness of what kind of television culture was here or how how long these kind of serial dramas have been running for yeah um, the most that we had kind of received in australia with coronation street and eastenders and yeah what episode of the bill and all of those um kind of exports that you have from here so i did as much research as i could and uh before going into the audition and yeah i mean it was definitely the kind of show that i would have i wanted to be a part of being, I guess, uh, something that had such a legacy in, in, in the UK. So, yeah. yeah, it was really, really exciting just to get the audition through. They, then they ended a, a couple of years ago. They, they just put it back onto the BBC iPlayer. So, Very well, so thank you. Yeah, so I've, I've had a lot of uh, kind of screenshots come up on my Instagram <laughs> of people screenshotting my face as a 15-year-old. So that, that's always fun. <laughs> Always of a uh, throwback. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's fun to always kind of look back on your work and remember. Oh, remember that kind of period of my my life yeah. when I lived in Scotland for six months. So 
yeah, it was great. It was a great experience. And what, what was the audition process like for that? I've only been here for a couple of months. Yeah, so the audition process, it was, it was actually quite quick. The turnaround for that was very um, quick. I, I went in and I met with Michelle Smith, who was a casting director on her at the time. And uh, I knew that this show was uh, set in Scotland. So I didn't know exactly what they wanted from the, the character. So I just kind of put two and two together and decided I'm going to try a Scottish accent. So, because <laughs> that's something that I just have in my back pocket. Yeah. Not really. So I watched as much of the show as I could to try to get my ear around what, what I would need to do. And I went into the audition and I met Michelle and I, we started, we had a chat, you know, how are you? And I always like to go in the room as, as if I'm not very comfortable in the accent, in the accent, just so that it doesn't push me off when I try to go into the accent for the season. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's not all the time. And uh, we did the scene and she said, where are you, where are you from, Chris? I said, oh, I'm actually, I'm from Australia, but I'm, I'm, I've just come here. And like, and where's your accent from? I said, <laughs> it's, uh, it's Scottish, because I, I know this show is set in Scotland. And I said, yeah, I think if they're going to, uh, they're going to cast a Scottish person, for this role, they're going to cast a Scottish person. So let's just use your accent. So, so <laughs> and that's what I ended up doing in, in the show, which was, which was fine. Um, and from then on, like I've always worked on my accents. Yeah. You know, Scottish, not a problem anymore. But yeah, going into that was, uh, having been like the first big audition that I got coming to the UK, it was, it was great. Like just, I went in, I did a couple of takes and then I'm, got a call two weeks before I had to move up to Scotland to, to start filming. So very quick. Yeah, that was pretty quick. And what was it like sliding right on nine seasons on? Was it kind of daunting or did you slot right on there? Um, yeah, I think it was, it was really overwhelming for me actually, because I had just relocated myself to the UK and then having to relocate again from London yeah. up to Scotland was like another big move on, on a show where I didn't actually know how long I was going to be on it for because I was only contracted for the first three months and then I had an extension after that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, and everyone that I met in the cast had been there for either a year or two before. So everyone knew each other, but they were all super welcoming. I remember the first time I actually went into the Waterloo Road School, which is, and actually it's a old abandoned school, the Depurpose School that they used to film in, they, um, I just went to go and get costume and, and makeup tests done. And Re Rebecca Craven and uh, Abby Mavis were, were going in to sort their dressing room out. And they were the first people that I met. And I'm still very close friends with them. So they were really welcoming off the get go. Um, and we had a great time. We went, you know, in our twenties, like, you know, on a BBC TV show, it was, yeah. it was great. Well, that's good because on screen in Waterloo Road, it's a very hostile environment, but it's obviously <laughs> not the same off camera. Yeah, no, absolutely not. I mean, I think with anything that you do, um, with any parts that you play, it's, it's always just, uh, it's just the characters, isn't it? Um, yeah. You never really carry any of that kind of scene stuff out into the real world. I mean, there's obviously shows and jobs that you do that it's never... It's never always going to be peachy and rosy with everyone that you work yeah, with. Yeah. But on that job in particular, like I made some really close friends that I still see like, you know, on a weekly, if not more than that basis or hear from them. So yeah. Yeah. Def it was definitely a very nice environment to be in. Yeah. Almost like a kind of family atmosphere, even to still be there. Still in yeah, I think it was funny though because uh, because I was playing a student and uh, we had teachers as well. And actually, I was probably closer in age to the teachers than I was to the kids yeah. playing the um, the students. But we were we were separated, so that teachers would be staying in Glasgow City, and then the students were staying in Greenock, which is uh, only like five ten minutes to set. Yeah. Um, so there was definitely that separation of like, you know, your adults and your kids. And it was a very strange uh, circumstance for me because I always felt like, wow, I just feel too old to be, 
you know, hanging out with 16 year olds when I was 25 at the time playing yeah. a 15 year old. So, you know, <laughs> it's quite a big, a big discrepancy in age, but it was great. Cause I kind of got to relive my adolescence again. So yeah. Yeah. And then speaking of adolescence, you played the character of Archie Wong. And yeah. uh, how did you bring that to life? Were you like that in school or was that a complete opposite? So, yeah, I think Archie like, was quite close to, to who I was as a, as a student. Probably not as sassy as him. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I was definitely more studious. Um, but he was definitely smarter than me. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> He can speak Mandarin and I can't. So, um, yeah, he's, he was definitely, um, I look, kind of look back on being in high school and thinking about, oh, what was that experience like and how did yeah. that correlate to like what I was trying to do in the show? And it's, it's not that far removed, except things were, you know, obviously quite heightened. Exacerbated, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're not blowing up science rooms and setting fires <laughs> and things like that. Just well, throwing, not, yeah, just throwing, <laughs> you know, paper balls at the teacher's head. So, yeah. Well, there we go. So we'll move on now to more questions about Heather's. Oh, or, uh, yeah. In the West End production, you played Kurt Kelly. And uh, I want to get, what were your first thoughts when you heard of Heather's as a musical from a cult classic movie to a musical? So I didn't know much about Heather's, to, to be honest, when I first uh, heard that it was casting. Um, my fiance, she's a musical theater actress as well. In fact, she does everything. And uh, she'd heard, you know, the soundtrack quite a bit. So she played it for me and I was like, yeah. oh, this is, this is really cool. Um, and I remember reading the casting breakdown on Spotlight, which is, um, if you don't know, it's like a, a kind of classified for, for actors, yeah. um, which your agent will submit you for your roles. And uh, then hopefully the casting director will come back and say, yeah, we'd love to see for um, this part. And I remember seeing the part of Kurt come up and, and say, oh, he's a bully. He's a jock. He's like, you know, a little bit, you know, not that smart. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as I say that, I'm saying not that smart. <laughs> um, so definitely me. Um, and I just remember thinking, oh, wow, I don't know if I could play that. I don't know if I could play that character because it yes. just it's like quite far removed from who I am and who, who, who I've always seen myself as an actor or a performer. And uh, I said, okay, well, I got a self tape through um, to send to the Americans um, with, with all of Kurt's material, like his, the new song that they were putting in, You're Welcome, yeah. um, and all of his sides, which, which obviously changed throughout the course because we got to workshop a lot of the, the piece um, to make it fit us, which was great. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I just, I sent the tape off to my agent, um, expecting nothing because, you know, you send out so many tapes yeah. as an actor, and I'm just like, okay, well, that one's gone into the universe. and <laughs> Never to be seen again. Um, yeah, and then I think like a week later, I, I got a call saying, yeah, the Americans watch your tape, they really love you, and, uh, and they're offering you the part. I was like, I complete, I was like, completely shocked and at that yeah. point like I hadn't I'd been going into things like you know um, other musicals and getting to the final rounds and it just falling apart at the end of just not coming through and, and that's yeah. just part of the game and I guess at that point you're just like the the all hope is lost point you're just like whatever if it happens it happens if it doesn't you know um, so it was just so far removed from my, from my thinking of where I was at in my yeah. life um, and then they offered it. And then a, a week later, it was rehearsal. And the first Monday, I was like, wow, it just kind of came and there it was. A really quick process, yeah. yeah. Everything was really quick with that job. The rehearsal process was only uh, three and a bit weeks. Um, and once we got to the other palace, we, we had, a, I don't even think we had even fully teched the show before we went into our first press rehearsal with with an invited audience who we were very forgiving because like you know we had to slide trucks around and move yeah, yeah. and everything and it was very very tight because the backstage area at the other palace is very small so just coordinating everything and making everything move not just on stage but off stage we had yeah. it fully worked out 
So by the time we had finished our first preview, we were like, okay, that's out of the way. And then when we had, uh, just before press night, everything was like set and it was just kind of running so smoothly. Um, yeah, but before we had even been in front of the audience, like me and Dom, who plays um, Ram opposite me, we hadn't even done a, a music call with the band for our song. So the first oh, time we, we got to run yeah. our song with a live audience. So that was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the kind of make or break moments of a show. Yeah, everything, definitely. everything seems to kind of come together at the last minute. Absolutely. And it never, it's never... It's never the worst scenario that you think of in your head. It's always got you're always gonna you know fly because you've got your castmates there with you. You've got your your crew. You've got your um, your band with you, and you've got the audience with you. That they don't want you to fail. They want you to yeah. do well. Even when you do fail, they're right there with you. They're like, yeah, come on, you can get back on it. And exactly, yeah. Going. And that, that's what the great the great fun about it is. So there is obviously before the West End production in 2014, there was the off-Broadway production. Yeah. And was that ever looming over you kind of as like an expectation we have to live up to this? And how did you cope with that pressure? Andy Fickman, our director, always kind of talked about kind of, the, I guess, the legacy of the show. And, uh, and all throughout the rehearsal process, you know, we would talk about the fifth Beatle coming in and the fifth Beatle being the audience. Yeah, and how much energy that gives you. And Andy went on about it so much and was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It can't be like, you know, they can't expect that much from us. And like, and, and to be fair, the show had sold out like in pre-sales before we had even like, you know, done any marketing or anything. They yeah. just knew, people knew it was coming to the other palace and they were right on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, so that kind of expectation that, that we felt was mostly from, you know, I guess what people, what the Americans had told us about how it was received in the US. Yeah. So when we came to opening night uh, at the other palace, I was like, the when when the Heather's reveal happens, the the lockers they open up, and I'd never felt like the ground just shook. It shook the amount of cheering and the amount of applause and the amount of screams. And it's, it was just exceptional. And that kind of, it ran on the whole way through until the end of our Haymarket run. It was just yeah. something that I'd never experienced. I don't think any of us had ever experienced that kind of hype. And, you know, to a certain extent, like, it's like, wow, I just, I never kind of expected this show to be that much of a hit it, but, yeah but it resonates with everyone and the more that we did it the more we kind of felt like really connected with our audience and 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 then again the more responsibility we felt to give a great show every night so even if you were feeling like oh it's gonna be a hard one tonight because everyone everyone gets that way it doesn't matter if you love your job or not it's some sometimes it's just harder but you knew that you know but those people out there were paying exactly the same amount as the, as the night before where you had a great time and you got to give it to them because they exactly. deserve it. Yeah. So there is that, that kind of expectation that you give yourself, you know, because every show should be at the same level for everybody. Yeah, exactly. And then it's kind of like the movie and the musical have their own kind of separate cult followings. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's like I always kind of liken it to the Rocky Horror Picture Show just yeah. in the way that the audience interact with the show. Uh, we, I mean, we even had a sing-along uh, version of Night at the, at the Haymarket where people were allowed to sing the song while we yeah. were performing it on stage, which we were all really dubious about, but it was great fun um, because people were singing along anyway. And, exactly. you know, <laughs> uh, it's not always the best when, you know, you want to go and watch it. Like if you're an audience member, you want to go and watch a show and there's like, you know, other people around singing the songs, but you want to hear the person on stage singing the songs. So that was a yeah. great release, I think, for a lot of people. And how did you bring Kurt Kelly to life? <laughs> um, I think Kurt kind of, for me, he like just doesn't exist without Ram. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
it was really like, I mean, I was really anxious going into rehearsal because I obviously before we went in, even though I hadn't known the show, I was sent the script and, and the score and I knew that I would be playing opposite someone else for the yeah. majority of the show. And uh, I was like, God, I really hope that I like this person that I'm playing opposite. Because like I said before, like, you don't always get along with the people that you have to work with. Uh-huh. It's, you know, so I was like, oh, gosh, I, you know, if we don't get along, this is going to be really hard. But as soon as I met Dom, like, we kind of took off like a house on fire and we just had fun. Yeah. I think, you know, even like allowing myself to do stupid things I never allowed myself to do in high school, like just completely letting your your imagination run wild and just not censoring yourself because that's what that's what you're like when you're you know when you're that character yeah yeah because you don't think you just act before you speak um so yeah i think a lot of it is credited to the fun and games that me and dom got to play with each other on on stage and then we shared a dressing room as well for yeah. the haymarket and the other palace we were we were all together an interesting room, but when we had our own dressing room, it was like <laughs> something else. We were just like, you know, cracking jokes all the time, or like, you know, dancing around. I have some great videos on my Instagram. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I do miss that aspect of it. It was. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, and um, earlier you were saying as well, you didn't really feel as if Kurt was you. So mm. that's what they kind of say. It's easier to play something that's an absolute opposite than trying to play like an extended version of yourself kind of yeah i mean it's it allows you to kind of get out of your skin isn't it yeah and that's what the thing about acting is is you know you get to be someone else for you know 90 minutes or whatever it is like yeah whatever you're doing um so yeah it, it allows you i don't think it allows you to remove yourself from yourself it, it just allows you to unlock different facets that you didn't yeah. know with that's a good so, way to put it, yeah. I know is there now. So I know that if I get that kind of brief again, it's like, I can play that. And funny thing is, is like, once you've done it, then all the castings that come afterwards, they're like, I'm like wow, now I'm just seeing like that for a while. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, high school jock. I'm like, oh, I'm getting that again. Okay. So it is funny how like, how you get seen again in different yeah. ways. It's kind of just like a switch now. The curtain, yeah, exactly. the jock switch, yeah. Before, like when I was auditioning for Waterloo Road, I was, you know, the kind of geeky teenager. Yeah. Now it's like the kind of dumb jock. So like you can't get like a broad spectrum. Yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're saying as well about "You're Welcome," which was the new song they added in the mm-hmm. West End version, and it kind of plays under the kind of creepier side of Curtain yeah. Around instead of in blue and off Broadway. It's kind of the darkier, dumb version. So what was that yeah. like, that switch? I mean, obviously, like you were saying before, there's like a lot of uh, legacy to the show and expectation. And, and people are very attached to uh, the, the soundtrack as it was from the off-Broadway cast. Yeah. And that's completely fair. It's a brilliant recording and they did a great job. Um, but, you know, like when Larry and uh, Kevin wrote uh, You're Welcome, they wanted to kind of, I guess change the perspective so that Veronica is coming out on top, you know, yeah. and she really does look like she wins over these two lechy guys that are like trying to get at her in, in a dark field, which is like obviously a very loaded situation. Yeah. Um, you know, not to sound like too crass, but it did, it felt like very, um, I don't know, sorted, I guess, like blue. It just felt like a bit, you know, they kind of like doing this. I don't even know how to describe it. It's a great song. I do love it. But, yeah. <laughs> You know, they wanted to change the tone of the piece to make it, it was more darker, yeah. yeah, as a whole. And, uh, and, and the way that they shaped it so that Carrie really comes out on top mm-hmm. of these two guys, it was brilliantly done. Um, there was a version of it as well at the other palace where, <laughs> where because we were in the cow, pa- uh, the cow pasture, Andy really wanted us to get mud on our face when Veronica trips us up. Yeah. So there was a lot of uh, tests with different kind of mud, like <laughs> cookie, cookies and uh, cookies and uh, poster paint, like brown poster paint. So yeah. that when we pull over, we'd go behind the fence and like get it smashed on our <laughs> face. And it was just a, it was an absolute disaster. So that kind of only lasted about three or four takes. And I'm really happy that that didn't take off. Because, 
that would have been very, very upsetting for like, you know, the next six months. So, yeah. yeah. But it's good to put your own kind of unique spin on things as well. So it's not just a direct copy of off Broadway. It's something unique and special. Yeah. yeah. And I like, I really, I love the fact that, you know, me and Dom are the only ones that have that as the recording, like, you know, that's the original recording of that song. Yeah. That's I mean, yours. That's unique. Yeah. Yeah. And there's not many, I mean, yeah, there's not many opportunities like that that you get uh, as a performer to have that um, to hold on to as a as a really great memento. So, yeah, I'm really happy about that. <laughs> exactly. And then our last question on Heather's is: What advice would you have for anyone else who's going to play the role of Kurt in the future? Oh, just have fun! Like, just have so much fun. Don't be inhibited because, like, literally, he can do anything. They, yeah. Don't. Um, <laughs> let me say, Dom, Ram, and Kurt, like. Me and Dom, like we, on the side of the stage, we had about 10 to 15 minutes where the Heathers are interacting with Miss Fleming and, and Veronica. And we just stood there before we come in with our next cue. And we're just like, well, how can we feel this? We did so many like different improvisations, just blowing yeah. bubbles with our spit for like, <laughs> disgusting, uh, which I would never do. But like, you know, that's the kind of thing that you get to have fun with and yeah. doing push-ups on one another and, doing all kinds of like silly stuff, like just giving each other noogies for like, and just <laughs> yeah. actually seriously play fighting for 10 to 15 minutes and, you know, getting paid for it. So just have, <laughs> just have fun and don't be inhibited by your thoughts of, well, this is going to look stupid because if you it's think it's going to look stupid, yeah. it will. Uh, but if you have fun with it and you genuinely invest in what you're doing, it's always going to be much better. So Yeah. Instead of kind of, you can half tell the person on stage is embarrassed by what they're doing. You have to just let loose. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So our last question about kind of acting in your career is, this will be a hard one, but what is your proudest career moment or highlight so far up to now? Ooh. Uh, so I think after I finished Heather's, um, I was auditioning for a few different things and I was auditioning for, uh, for Shakespeare, um, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. And, uh, it was at the Globe in London. And I think for me as an actor, like if I look back to when I was living in Australia, like things just felt so untouchable. Um, there are certain institutions that, you know, a kid from Australia with, with, I didn't go to drama school. I did all my training like ad hoc, um, you know, so having that kind of expectation, they're not going to want to see me for, you know, big institutions like the Globe or the National or the Donmar or whatever it may be. Yeah. I've, you know, I've worked at the National now, I've auditioned for the Donmar, you know, and now like when I got the audition through for the Globe, I was like, oh, you know what? Just to be auditioning is enough, you know, to be able to go yeah. through the process of like being close enough to step on the stage there. Because it it's something that should be revered. It's like, you know, it's history. Yeah, it's monumental, yeah. Yeah, even if it's not the real one, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I went through the, the process for that while I was still in Heather's. And I think as Heather's finished, um, I, I got cast in, in Romeo and Juliet as Paris and the Prince. And I've never had such a fun and fulfilling time as an artist as, as a person, as, and just felt a whole bunch of growth as a performer. Because that stage, to command that stage is really difficult because it's so big, there is no amplification. There is just your body and your voice and the people around you. Yeah. And uh, once the first time I stepped out, the project that I did there was actually for schools as well. So it was a, it was a school adaptation. It was 90 minutes of Romeo and Juliet straight through. Um, and to see all the kids in the, in the groundings yelling and screaming as soon as you walked out on stage. I mean, I thought Heather's was like, you know, crazy. Yeah. That was like level, like, you know, there's two, two, 3000 people around you everywhere and you just become enveloped and you're in this kind of thunderdome of fear. Yeah. Um, and it's electrifying. So, yeah, I think that was probably my proudest career moment. I mean, every, every job that you do is, it gives you a sense of pride because you're getting to yeah. do what you love. You're getting to get paid for it, which is always nice. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're, you're allowing, you know, 
other people to see you on stage. I remember one, one instance on that job um, at the Globe is you can see through the, the doors into the, the groundlings and there was a yeah. little kid there. He was trying to look up at the stage. So just before we went on stage, and I was like, he's a little East Asian kid. And I was like, wow, like he's going to get to see someone like me like yeah. a reflection of himself on stage, which I never got to see growing up. So like, yeah. who knows what that could do for him to think like, wow, I can do that too, you know? Exactly, yeah. It's super powerful for me. So those kinds of moments are like, you know, they're few and far between, but when they happen, they're like, you know, it's great. Especially that moment with the wee boy. At yeah. The door, because even when you were saying, he thought, oh, no one wants to see me on a stage. I won't yeah. be doing that. And then if he was thinking the same and sees you on stage, then the things I could do for him, yeah. That's exactly right. I mean, and those, that's, that's really why you want to do it. You want to affect change, especially yeah. you know, when you do um, any kind of performance, even with Heather's, like Heather's had such a, a great message behind it. But I just remember looking out and, you know, looking at all the cool nuts that we had there and just, they didn't know each other, but the feeling of acceptance that they had, yeah. each other, finding their space and finding their people, like that's just so powerful and that's what theater is about you know it's it's being with like-minded people that you know that lift you up and, and it should make you feel good when you leave yeah. you can think you know and it's just it's tragic like what's happening now so hopefully oh, yeah. whatever goes forward you know it, it will survive fingers crossed it will come back but yeah. it'll be a, a long haul yeah so speaking of what's happening now, we're going to segue on to more questions about the current global situation. I don't think we can say the actual word. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> like, what? <laughs> exactly. So the first question is, have you noticed any kind of unexpected benefits of lockdown or isolation? Um, when I guess lockdown started, I... I was really like energized by it because you know I was like okay so like I got to get these things in place now so I'll have like a routine so if it lasts more than three weeks then you know I'm gonna be okay and I felt like super positive I kind of got my working stuff in place and was cooking and like everything was kind of taking off and then I just like hit fatigue you know I think around the five the fifth or sixth week everyone was just like no I'm done with this now like I don't to be in this situation anymore um so yeah i mean like the benefit was that i was super productive at the start and now i've kind of learned to manage my expectations of what i need to do to get through day by day because i think you know running a sprint at the start it's just it it just kind of led to burnout and now it's all about managing this until whatever that it you know goes back to normal whatever that normal is, yeah whatever that normal will be um yeah and just i guess one of the other benefits is is like you know reflecting back and just saying you know what i don't need to put any pressure on myself right now because yeah. no one needs to be putting pressure on themselves right now if you wake up and you just get through the day that's enough for now exactly yeah you need to do um because you know people when i when this first started me and my fiance we put a you know a whole bunch of duets up and then that was great but then it just kind of became like something that we had to do yeah it feels like you're kind of stuck on it yeah and everyone else was you know putting up content and making new things and and it's like well what am what am i doing this for it's not making me feel good anymore like it did the first few times i think i need to take a step back so just knowing how to like gauge where you need to be at because you know, if, if my best mate is putting out like whatever, amazing, I'm going to watch that. But yeah. I don't need to put any pressure to put anything else out to be the exactly. next best thing. There is no competition in COVID-19. Yeah. So. I think that's the most important thing is the balance. Because yeah. with all the time in the world, you can get stuff done, you can be creative, but also you can just take it easy and relax as well. Exactly. I mean, like I had massive plans to like write a screenplay at the start of this thing. Have I written a word yet? No. <laughs> Have I thought about it? Yeah, definitely. I'm going to get that that tomorrow, you know, but 
until I do, it's still there and it doesn't it doesn't cause me any anxiety that I haven't done anything with it because like what am I gonna do with it once it's finished? <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know. So how have you been kinda keeping yourself taken over, keeping sane journal? Uh so like I said, like I'm really lucky. I, I, I run a personal training business as well. So I still see my clients via uh online connection, which is great. Yeah. Um so that takes up about, you know, a good 15, 20 hours of my week, which is really nice because also like I get to see different faces all the time. They yeah. get to have an interaction with me, with people that are not in their house and we get to work out and we get to feel good, um, get those endorphins running, and, you know, really yeah. make a positive step for the day. Um, but other than that, like I, I also, I've started running since the lockdown started, um, which I never used to do. Uh, I used to just look, lift a lot of weights and, and now that I don't have a gym to go to, which is fine, I, I picked up running, which has really done great things for my mental health because um, yeah. it's just something that I can like, you know, stride on. And again, another one of those things that I don't have to put pressure on myself for, like I don't need to run a marathon. If I want to have a jog today, I can have a jog. if I want to try and beat my time from the other day, I can do that too. Um, I do a lot of reading. Uh, I mean, started going back into acting class and singing lessons via Zoom. So just doing all different kinds of things to fill the day. It's not like, yeah. you know, very kind of methodical, but it is, it's just, you know, how I feel day by day. I'll do this today. I'll do that. <laughs> exactly. And that's what some people are starting to say as well. It's not really socially distanced. It's physically distanced because you yeah. can still keep in touch with so many people. That's right. That's a hundred percent right. Um, like, now that you know you can go out and you can see more people here um i'm just still keeping it local you just got to keep it local yeah, <laughs> for the moment exactly, you know, yeah. where you feel like more kind of comfortable with you know the situation at hand um which i don't know when that will be you know every day it might change so exactly, yeah. that's it and then our last question is what advice would you have for anyone you could be struggling with lockdown because we know it can affect your mental health quite badly. I think, yeah, I think like, just like I said, do what's right for you and don't think about what everyone else is doing because your coping mechanism to be, you know, healthy and safe throughout this period might just be getting up and feeding yourself and watching some Netflix and having lunch again and reading a book and then going to sleep. You know, you don't have to do anything exorbitant. Exactly. Um, so take the pressure off. Definitely try and get outside. I, I've talked to, you know, unless you're like, you know, supposed to be sheltering, then don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if you can, and if it just hasn't occurred to you how important it is to be out in, in open space, it really is important to be out in, in the environment, in nature. Exactly, yeah. You know, incredible things, even if it's just for a walk. I had a friend of mine, um, I saw her on, uh, I talked to her on Skype on a Thursday. I was, it's like, she seemed really down and tired. I said, what have you been doing this? She's like, no, nah, I've just been working. Like, have you been out of your house? She's like, no, no. I was like, no wonder you're not feeling yeah, great. You, exactly. go out for, you need to go out for a walk, a long walk tonight, and just breathe in some fresh air and look yeah. around, see what's around you, because it will make you feel 10 times better. Um, so yeah, like... Do things for you, not for anyone else. Yeah. And it is important to get out and kind of clear your head and not yeah. be like the same four walls all the time. Because that yeah. would be crazy. Yeah. I mean, like even at the start of lockdown when it was really strict and I would just go out for my exercise once a day and I'd go out for an hour and then come back. It's like, wow. And like now I can't, I can't go anywhere. I'm, I'm in the home, you know. Yeah. And now that we have more liberties, like you should definitely be taking a little bit more advantage. But, you know. At not line to go to night town, you know, because you can buy stuff online now. Exactly. You always buy stuff online. You don't need to go into the shops, people. I know. Be sensible, but at the same time, do you get out there? That's right. So I think that just about does us for today. Cool. So thank you, everyone, for watching today's episode. And a big thank you to Mr. Chris Chung for volunteering his time and coming on. No um, worries. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Same goes. So thank you guys, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye.